Good morning. And welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Christian Marquardt. Very good to have you here this chilly morning. It is, it's been kind of cold recently, but at least the building is warm, and we're glad to have you. Today is the last Sunday of the church year, and normally, uh, normally today is a Sunday that we call Christ the King Sunday, and we celebrate Jesus being our King and looking forward to his return. But today we have something a little bit different. We're going to have a sermon from a book that I don't know if I've ever heard a sermon from before, and that's good. We're going to learn something new today. We're going to get started with our opening hymn. Um, that is hymn number 486. You'll find that near the back of the blue hymnal. The words are also displayed on the screen. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen.
Our worship continues on page number 188 in the front of the blue hymnal using the service setting three. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the writings of the prophet Habakkuk. And I won't get into it in too much detail right now because this will also be the reading for our sermon text. But the prophet Habakkuk is looking and waiting for God's judgment, saying, when is God going to come and destroy evil? When is God going to come and set his people free? When is it going to happen? And the Lord's answer is, it's going to happen, but on my timeline, not on yours. A reading from the writings of Habakkuk, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes in the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Our worship continues with the anthem from our choir. Thank you. 
Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 22. In these verses, we again have the same promise. Yes, the Lord is coming. He is coming soon, again on his timing, and not our own, but he is coming. And when he comes, he will restore everything the way it's supposed to be. He will deal with everyone in justice and fairness, and the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ will finally be realized by all of us. A reading from Revelation 22, beginning at verse 6. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and of all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right, and let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The word of the Lord. Our worship continues as we join in singing our gospel acclamation. We will use the gospel acclamation for God's love. Please stand. Alleluia, alleluia. in the Lord for his love and faithfulness. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. The gospel reading for the final Sunday of the church year comes from Luke chapter 12. The reading begins at verse 35. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. Our worship continues with the singing of our hymn of the day. It's hymn number 487 in the back of the blue hymnal. The words are also on the screen.
How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Now, I said before the service, we're going to be hearing something that you might not have known about, and it's an Old Testament book called Habakkuk. And I bet most of you cannot tell me one verse out of Habakkuk. It's not like John, the Gospel of John, where everybody can quote John 3, verse 16. It's not like other specific verses in the Bible where people would say, this is my memory verse, this is a verse that I think about when I'm falling asleep. The Lord is a, a light for my path. I know the Lord is my shelter, the Lord is my refuge, verses like that, but we have Habakkuk. And uh, reading this, it's actually really good. Um, and it's really interesting because the content of this is different from a lot of other sections in the Bible. It's deeply personal. You know, this is a man's conversation. It's almost as if this was just what he said to God and it was written down for our benefit all these years later. We don't really know who Habakkuk was all that much. There's not a lot of verses in scripture that tell us who he was, but we can understand him just from what he writes, just from three chapters. That's the entire book. And they're not very long chapters either. And this is all the thing, this is the only thing that the prophet wrote. This is it. You know, if you read through Isaiah or Jeremiah, you'll read very long books, you know, 50 chapters, 60 chapters. But if you read Habakkuk, it's only three. And he only had a few things to talk about, and yet reading them, it seems so relevant today. Um, as Christians um, and people around the world are trying to figure out what to make of the World Cup coming up. Some people saying the World Cup is in Qatar, there are human rights abuses, perhaps people should boycott the event, not go, not watch it, not participate at all. Um, and even apart from whatever else is going on, it's good for us to know, should we ever go to Qatar, that Christianity is not legal there, and Christian missionaries who have been trying to spread the gospel and share their faith have been deported. It's not a country that's very welcoming to Christians. In fact, it's the opposite. So for whatever else they have going on, as Christians, we should know there are a lot of countries around the world where we're not welcome. And that's one of them. And I hear about that thinking about the amount of freedom that we have here in the United States, that here we can gather publicly on a Sunday and worship together and go home and I can buy Christian verses that I got from a store and I can put them up, verses from the Bible or Christian sayings, or I can hear sermons, I can read the Bible in my own language, I can buy it at a store. I have access to all of those things and knowing that Christians around the world don't have all of those benefits, including in Qatar, okay? But there are other countries where again, Christians are not free in the same way that we are free, they're even persecuted by the government. And that's the case in China. And I know that a lot of people talk about China and they talk about China's economy, the US's economy, they talk about everything in money terms. And yeah, money's important. I mean, money pays the bills, money puts a roof over your head and puts food on the table and all of that. You gotta have a job and earn money. So talking about money is important, but talking about Christianity in China, uh, it's not really allowed. Um, you can't share your faith with somebody who's younger than 18. You'd get in trouble. You can't have large groups of Christians gathering together. They might get in trouble. There's a state church, but it's not a very good church. The government runs it, but most of the really true Christians gather together in house churches. It's almost like the way the early church was 2,000 years ago. That's the way that it is today in China. I have to be careful about how I say this next thing. Um, I'm aware that there is missionary work being done in China. But whenever I talk about it, or we talk about it, if anything goes online, and this is being recorded and is going to be uploaded later, we can't talk about the people who are there. Because there are ways of finding out names and people and places 
and putting two and two together and getting people in trouble. So even today, Christians in China have to go underground. They can't share their faith openly. You might have seen um, a person when you're going to a Brewers game or a Bucks game or something, somebody standing out on a corner with a sign saying, repent now. And I don't think that's the best mission strategy, but I admire the person who's doing it. If you did that in China, it would not work out very well for you. And it wouldn't just be here in the U.S. where people walk past or people might yell a rude comment. It would be, you're going to be arrested at best. And there's one other country I want to talk about just as we recognize our lives are so easy as Christians compared to what people have to go through on the other side of the world. Um, in North Korea, in the capital city, um, in Pyongyang, I don't suppose we would be able to do this. You know, gather together to worship, we would not. We would be arrested, we might get put in a labor camp, we might just be killed on the spot. You are not allowed to worship Jesus over there. But it was not always that way. Um, in the late 1880s, there was a Christian, Christian missionary who went over there and he helped out the royal family um, with some kind of medical issue, and then he was allowed to share his faith. This is in 1880, and by 1910, there were over 100,000 Christians in the capital city. And some people actually called it, they said it was the Jerusalem of the East. And this is true, if you want, you can go home and read about it more. They called it the Jerusalem of the East, and then things fell apart. But know that at one point in North Korea, in the capital city, there were probably almost 300,000 Christians, which is almost as much as our entire denomination. <laughs> but the gospel continues to do work even in those challenging situations and to know that here we have the most freedom. And it seems that more and more people are leaving the faith, even as easy as they have it. And when the prophet Habakkuk writes these words, these first few verses in chapter 1, he's talking about his own people. He says, Lord, how long is this going to go on? How long are our own people going to do what's wrong? How long am I going to see violence? And I know that God hates violence. And I know that God hates injustice. And I know that God hates wrong. Why does it keep happening? And I love reading this section because just about everybody in here has asked that at one point or another. God, why don't you just step in? God, why don't you do away with it? Why do Christians have to be persecuted across the world? Why is it so difficult for them to share the gospel? Why do our people do what's wrong? Why does God even put up with that? Why do we hear about abuses in the church? Why do I hear about leaders in the church misusing their power, misusing their authority, mistreating people? Why do we hear about that? Why doesn't God just put an end to all of it? Why doesn't he just come back? Why is it taking so long if he said, I'm coming soon? And Habakkuk gets his answer. And he said, God, when is it going to happen? Is it going to come now? Because I see the world is so full of sin. Even our own people are so full of sin. Can you just end it? And he said, it's going to come. The Lord said, write it down and make it plain. And a herald can run with it. Somebody can run and share the news. This is going to happen. I'm going to come back. I'm going to take care of all of this. It's going to happen. Though it, I, I love the way that this is worded. Um, in chapter 2, verse 3, the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end. It will not prove false. It's coming. It's not there yet. But God has an end in mind. Though it linger, wait for it. Oh, it seems like it's lingering so much. It would seem like if the Lord would just come back right now, today, that would be, why not? Why shouldn't it be today? It's cold outside. I don't have that much to look forward to. I mean, I have a baby on the way. I am looking forward to that. But, you know, apart from that, apart from that, why not today? There's injustice. There's wrong. There's sin. There's people mistreating one another. There's people lying. Why not today? Why wouldn't it be today? And it's like, it's like it's lingering. Like, God, you must have a different idea in mind than I do. 
because I think today seems like a good day, but God has apparently decided, well, it could still be today, I suppose. It could be at like 8 p.m., but it's not yet. It's not yet. And that's hard. It's hard when we hear about people being mistreated. It's hard when we hear about mistreatment from the world and governments persecuting Christians. It's hard when we hear about things happening from inside the church. Maybe that's even harder. And we say, God, can you just end it? And in this book, chapter one, it says, is an oracle. And actually, I'm skipping around verses. And I wish I could take like an hour and a half and go through the entire book. I don't know that you're ready for that today. I don't know if you're used to that. You're not used to me preaching for an hour and a half. So I'm not going to do that. I'll just give you real quickly, here's what happens in the book of Habakkuk. He says, God, there's all this wrong happening within the people. And what we have to assume is, because God's reply is, well, I'm going to send Babylon. So Babylon's not there yet. This is probably between, I mean, it must be between 722, when the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians, and 586, when the southern kingdom of Judah which included the city of Jerusalem, fell to the Babylonians. So it's somewhere in that time frame that Habakkuk is writing. And he says, there's so much injustice and wrong from God's own people. God, when are you going to get rid of that? And he said, oh, I'm going to get rid of it. In fact, I'm going to send the Babylonians to punish them. And then Habakkuk doesn't love that response. And then he says, well, what about them? When is God going to get rid of the Babylonians? Because that doesn't seem like it solves the issue entirely. And God says, no, I'm going to judge them too. I'm going to take care of everything. I'm going to fix it. And then we get to chapter 3. And chapter 3 is like a psalm. Actually, I took a couple words out just because we don't exactly know what they mean, but they're for some kind of musical notation. I don't, we don't know what it is. But it's the same kind of wording that you find in the book of Psalms. But he calls it a prayer. And he, and he, says, he says, God, I, I know you're good. You know, I heard that from my father. I heard that from my, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. I know that's been passed down. I, I know that God is good. I know that he's done wonderful things. God, could you do that again? Could you set us free again? But don't just, don't just destroy, but in wrath, remember mercy. Because even as he's talking about how his people have sinned and done wrong, he says, Lord, can you show us your mercy too? Can you forgive us for all the ways that we've let you down? For the way that we've mistreated one another? For the way that we haven't made good use of the promise of the Savior? And instead of talking about the Savior to come, we've gone in search of so many other things. Lord, can you forgive us too? Can you show us mercy? Because we need it. Judgment is fair. God's wrath is fair, but can you show us mercy too? God says, yes, I will. And that's why today when we gather, we don't just talk about Habakkuk the prophet. We don't talk about a promise that's yet to come, but we look back to something that's already happened. We say today is a day to celebrate Jesus Christ, who was promised in the Old Testament and finally was fulfilled. He came, he was sent by God the Father to die for us. For sinners. Habakkuk said, God, even in, in your church, even among believers, there are sinners. Why, why won't you do something about it? And the way that God has chosen to deal with it, has chosen to deal with all of us, is to show us mercy and to forgive us. And if you want to know why he hasn't come back yet, that's why. Because the moment I start saying, Lord, the world is so evil, why don't you end this specific thing? Okay, what, what are we talking about in particular? Say, well, um, you know, there seems like the world is awful lot of um, sexual sin today. God, that seems really bad. Can you just get rid of that? And Jesus says, okay, well, anyone who looks at someone lustfully has already broken that commandment. Are you sure you still want me to kill everyone who's broken that commandment? And I say, well, I don't know, God. I, I mean, there's other things that are wrong, too. Well, I mean, it seems like there shouldn't be so much murder. You know, murder is wrong. 
God, can we, get, can we get rid of that? Get rid of all the murderers. No more murder. That would be really good. And God says, well, if you hate someone in your heart, it's like you've murdered them. I view it as the same kind of thing. You're just as guilty. And they say, oh, God, well, well there's, there's got to be other sins, too, that are wrong. If God got rid of every wrongdoer on earth, there would be nobody left. That includes me, and that includes you. And the only reason we can look forward to his return is because he's shown us mercy. And our God says, I forgive you, I love you, I'll forgive you again tomorrow. The same thing every single day. I am faithful even when you are not. And our Lord has more people in mind to share that message with. And it might be people here in the U.S., and it might be people in Qatar, and it might be people in China, it might be people in North Korea, but all over the world, the gospel message is being shared, even when people are being persecuted. There are still Christians in those countries. There are still people who are willing to risk death to share the gospel message. I wish we could be as bold as that. And Habakkuk is still waiting. And you and I are still waiting. And as he thinks about what God has promised is going to come, destruction was going to come to his people, they were going to go into exile. And as he's thinking about it, he sort of decides for himself, I can still rejoice no matter what happens. I can still have joy no matter what God is going to bring upon us. He said, though the fig tree doesn't bud, if there's no grapes on the vines, if there's no olive crops, if the troops have come in and destroyed everything, if they've taken all of our animals, the fields don't produce any food, if there's no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Savior. He's my strength. He makes my feet strong. He gives me joy. And we might say, Habakkuk, um, you're kind of foolish because that sounds bad. You said if God took away all of your material possessions, if he took everything away from you, you could still rejoice? You could still find happiness? You could still have contentment and peace? How could you do that? And Habakkuk can reply, well, God made a promise to me. And when God makes a promise to me, I know he's going to keep it. And when God says, I'll provide for you, I, he's done that every day. Hasn't always been in the same way, but I'm still here. And when God said, I'm going to send a Savior, I, I believe he's going to do that. And when God said, I'm preparing a place for you, I know he's going to do that. And so you and I, even as we face adversity, even if we face persecution, even as Christians are facing that all over the world, when we see injustice and when we see wrong, we can still say, I can rejoice even now. Because when God makes me a promise, I know he's going to keep it. Because he kept all the other ones. He said, I'm going to send you a savior, and he did that. He said, I'm going to prepare heaven and eternity for you, and he did that. And I know if God is good for that, he can be good for even smaller things. So even though we face adversity, yet will I rejoice. Amen. Our worship continues as we join in our confession of faith. Um, using the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on page 196. In the front of the blue hymnal, the words are also on the screen. Please stand as we join together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our prayer of the church. Loving God and Lord, you created the universe that surrounds us and the globe on which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Give your word power as it works in hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Whether we pray together or alone, you've promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, Prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. We continue on page number 199. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in, rem in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Now this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will strengthen and preserve you, the one true faith to life everlasting. All of your sins are forgiven. You may live in peace. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, O God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Good morning, everyone. Look at that PowerPoint. Look how I messed up that formatting. It's not all lined up. Terrible. Man, that third verse, you know, my sin, sins are taken away, not in part, but in whole. That's, that's just really beautiful. Um, thank you for being here. This is our final Sunday of the church here, which means next Sunday is Advent. And we're going to look forward to having that next Sunday. This Thursday is also Thanksgiving, and St. James has, for many, many years, I don't even know how long, maybe before I was born, uh, had a Thanksgiving service. So there will be a, a service here, a worship service here at 9 a.m. Um, on Thursday. You're welcome to attend that if you're in town and not um, trying not to burn the turkey, but you're welcome to be here. We're, we'd love to have you. We will have Bible study this morning. Um, it will not be in the sanctuary because the kids are practicing for their program, correct? So the kids are practicing in here. We are going to steal, not actually steal, but we're going to take the gathering place for Bible study. We'll probably it won't start until about 1045, but it'll be there in the gathering place. We're continuing um, the study that we had started like a month ago called I Can't Believe That's in the Bible. Um, so today we're going to learn about Hosea, some really interesting stuff. There is an elders meeting on Monday, uh, men's morning ministry. I put a question mark, but I'm planning to be here on Saturday. So if you're a man and you're here Saturday morning, I'm going to be here. So show up, okay? Um, two other things. One of them is the Christmas party is coming up very soon now. That's Friday, first Friday in December. Um, I think that's the second. Yeah, so that's here at St. James in the gathering place. It starts at 7 there will be a white elephant gift exchange. Bring a bad gift. You don't want it. Somebody else might really love it, or they might hate it just as much as you, and then we'll see it again next year. But that's sort of the idea. Um, finally, there is an insert in the bulletin about um, how St. James is a part of the member assistance program. It's a program that St. James entered to provide Christian counseling to those who are um, if you're interested, if that's something that you'd say, I have been thinking about trying out counseling, um, St. James has access to some of those options. So if that is you, check out this sheet and um, let me know. And if not, then either way, I will greet you at the door. God's blessings on the rest of your Sunday. And we'll look forward to Advent and the season of preparing our hearts for our Savior. Have a good day.